If you clicked on this video, you're probably looking to learn about what you're supposed to do on a certain boss or all bosses in Black Temple. There's a whopping 9 bosses in this raid, so let's not waste any more time and get right into it. So to start off, the trash in this instance is not very hard at all, but when there's something dangerous worth mentioning, I will definitely mention it in this video. And the first dangerous pack you'll meet is right before the first boss. This pack isn't super hard, but the reason why people usually wipe on it is because they don't know that the Coil Scar Generals have an ability called Free Friend that removes any CC you would do on any mob. So instead of CCing, just stack everything and mark something to kill. Generally people kill the Soothsayers first as they heal. Okay, now for High Warlord Nagentis. There's three main important abilities in this fight, Needle Spine, and Paling Spine, and Tidal Shield. Needle Spine is a simple ability that the boss casts on three random players. The thing is, once a player is hit, it also deals damage to other nearby players. So range DPS should really be spread as much as possible in a cone behind the boss. Melees should be stacked behind the boss to minimize damage too if they're hit. Next up, you have Impaling Spine. About every 20 seconds, the boss will target a random player and throw a spine on him. This will deal 4 to 5k damage on impact and then applies a dot that takes for 2.7k every 3 seconds. The thing is, another player can actually remove the spine from the player hit by it, by clicking on it. Once you remove a spine from a player, it will go to your inventory. Make sure you know where it went in your inventory to deal with the next ability. The final ability is Tidal Shield. About every 60 seconds, the boss will cast this on him, becoming immune to any any damage and healing himself. The way you remove this shield is by having a player throw a spine that they grabbed earlier onto the boss. But once you do that, the shield will break and it will deal 8.5k frost damage to the whole raid. So before doing this, make sure everyone is topped off or at least above 8.5k HP. But you also don't want to wait too long since the boss heals himself as the shield is active. So the moment the shield becomes active, healers should start topping off everyone ASAP. But that's not just a healer job. Make sure to have everyone grab a hellstone before the fight and use it once the shield goes on the boss to be able to break it ASAP. Nagentis will enrage after 8 minutes, but that's pretty much all the fight. Moving up to the next boss, remember that you can not only mount up in this next big room, but you can also skip most of the trash. I do suggest pulling any flying orcs around the boss area though, so you don't pull them accidentally during the fight. Okay, Supremus. This boss is pretty easy easy, but a lot of people will die from standing where they shouldn't. So during phase 1 for Supremus, you need two tanks constantly alive. One tank will hold threat on the boss, and the second tank will soak hateful strikes, which is a melee attack that deals 27 to 32k damage to the next player with the highest current health within melee range. So needless to say, healers stay on top of the off tank at all times, otherwise he will die and melees will start falling one after the other. Also, during phase 1 you have Molten Flames. It's a blue trail of fire that starts from Supremus' feet and moves in a straight line towards a random player. Obviously, move out of that ASAP. After 60 seconds, Supremus switches to phase 2. On phase 2, you have two abilities to deal with. The first one, and the one that will be the source of most deaths during this fight, is the volcanoes. There will be a few volcanoes pounding around the room and spitting fireballs that deal 4 to 5k damage per second to any target within 15 yards of the volcano. Move out of that ASAP. The second ability during phase 2 is Gaze. About every 10 seconds, the boss will fixate a player and start running towards him. If the boss reaches said player, he or she will very likely be one shot. So if you're targeted by this, make sure to run away from the boss, but also avoid any volcanoes on the ground. And you don't need to worry too much about being too close to the boss during this phase. Because if you're targeted and you're in melee range, you will be knocked back and dealt 5k damage to. So it is recommended to be away from the boss at all times, but not absolutely necessary. Keep DPSing the boss mostly. Those two phases will keep alternating about every 60 seconds until the boss is dead. Moving up to Shade of Akama. This is probably among the easiest bosses in the game, and some don't even consider it a boss, so I'm not gonna waste too much time on it. Basically, you start the fight by talking to Akama, and your goal will be to kill all the Ashtong Channelers banishing the Shade of Akama. Once you do that, the Shade of Akama will move to Akama himself, and you'll need to quickly deal with it before it kills him, and that's pretty much it. 
That being said, there will be waves of mobs spawning all throughout the fight. They're really not that hard and you can choose to deal with them how you see fit. Either stack all of them and AoE them down or split your raid in three groups. One for each of the two doors and one for dealing with the channelers. But yeah, once that's done and you kill the boss, you'll unlock a teleport from the entrance of the raid to outside this room, where you can repair and get to the next bosses quickly if you wipe. So make sure to use it. Okay, next up we have Terran Gorfiend. So Gorfiend is a very simple fight and for the most part your one goal is to kill him as fast as possible. So lust as soon as you engage him, pump all your cooldowns at the start, rinse and repeat until he's dead. That being said, during this fight there is one ability that will be aimed at a random player and if that first player that gets targeted by this doesn't know how to deal with this, you will definitely wipe. That ability is Shadow of Death. So every 30 seconds, a random raid member will receive the Shadow of Death debuff. After 55 seconds, the debuff will turn the player into a ghost, and it will also spawn four shadowy constructs at the location where that happens. Your goal if you're targeted by this is to run away as far away from the raid as possible, and kill those constructs before they reach the boss and wipe everyone. To do that, you have a bar with five abilities. First off, I want you to completely ignore Spirit Strike and Spirit Shield, the spells on number 1 and number 7 respectively. The moment the constructs spawn, you want to AoE them down instantly using Spirit Volley, number 5 on your pet bar. After that, you want to root them using Spirit Chains on number 4. At this point, what you want to do is target one, cast two Spirit Lenses on him, tap to the next one, cast two Spirit Lenses, tap to the next one, etc. Once Spirit Volley is off cooldown, use it again, followed by Spirit Chains again, then cast two spirit lenses on a target, tap to the next one, etc. Rinse and repeat until all the mobs are dead. Once the first player targeted by this debuff manages to do this, the following times where Shadow of Death happens are very simple to deal with, because there's always going to be two ghosts active at any given time from there, so they can gang up on the constructs and kill them very easily. The first ghost is the one that has to nail it to not have a wipe. And actually, if you want to practice this in advance, there's actually a very fun flash game that will teach you how to deal with this ability. If you still have a lot of people struggling with this in your guild, I highly suggest linking this to them. Link for this will be in the description of this video. After you're done with this boss, you have the choice between two bosses, Gurtog Blood Boil or Reliquary of Souls. We're gonna start with Gurtog here. But before you get to him, there's one trash worth talking about, the Bone Chewer Behemoth. For this, you want everyone want to stack up behind the mob as he uses Meteor and also does a stump which deals 4k damage and stuns everyone for 3 seconds. But don't worry about that, it's more important to stack to soak the Meteor. Okay, so Gurtog Blood Boil. This fight is not a DPS race but more a battle for survival and a tough healer gear check. So for this fight you want 3 tanks. It is possible but more difficult with 2. Let's explain tank stuff real quick. First off, all 3 tanks must equip full mitigation and they also need to be always the top 3 on the threat list, so they must fight each other for threat throughout the fight. And the boss is taunt immune by the way. Every time the current tank is hit, an acidic wound stack will be applied to him, building up over time. You want one of the off tanks to take over once the main tank has about 15 to 20 stacks. That's around 30 seconds into the fight. Okay, next let's talk about Blood Boil. This is a debuff cast every 10 seconds on the 5 raid members furthest away from Gurtog, and it does stack. If you're a melee, you're not concerned with this, but if you're a caster or a healer, listen up. How you deal with this is you stack everyone near the waterfall outside the water, and have 5 players move to the water. Take Blood Boil, move back to the group, have the next 5 players move to the water, take Blood Boil, etc. And this is easier to do than it sounds, because you can just assign for example group 3 to start in the water. Once group 3 gets the debuff, the raid lead calls for group 4 to go in the water, and group 3 returns and stacks with everyone else. Then once group 4 gets it, group 5 goes in, etc. until the boss transitions into phase 2. I suggest you're ready to practice this before the pool if it's your first time. So phase 2 happens after the 5th blood boil, and it's definitely the most heal intensive moment of this fight. Have everyone spread out before the 5th blood boil happens, because a random player will receive fell rage, which will do an AoE damage around the player, and will also increase their damage, healing, health and armor, but they will also be targeted by the boss. The player that received 
leave this debuff must stand still and use any damage mitigation abilities they have. Here's a list of all the abilities different classes can use. Healers want to heal that target primarily, because if he or she dies, the boss will go to the tank and probably one-shot him. But on top of that, there's also 15 players with blood boil at this point, and also tanks with acidic wound, so they must also keep healing other players. This is where most groups wipe. If your healers can manage to get you past this, you'll likely heal the boss. Moving on to Reliquary of Souls. The way to this boss is actually a gauntlet with mobs respawning fast if you lag behind too much, so keep moving quick through this. But once you reach the boss, here's how to deal with it. This is a three-phase fight, and while each phase is active, you'll have a permanent aura active on every player. During phase one, it's Aura of Suffering, which reduces healing, regeneration, and armor by 100% and defense by 500. So since no healing is possible, tanks must be rotated during this phase. Thankfully, it's very easy to switch tanks. The way you do it is basically the closest player to the boss will have permanent aggro. So to switch tanks, you simply have the off tank step in front of the current tank. Also, every 45 seconds, the boss goes into enrage for 15 seconds. Incidentally, a rogue's evasion is also 15 seconds. So it's not a bad idea to have a rogue step close to the boss, take aggro and pop evasion to tank him. You also have a debuff called soul drain during this phase, which can and should be dispelled. Once the boss reaches zero health, you'll transition into phase two. The transition is marked by a bunch of mobs spawning. They have very low HP and deal almost no damage, so don't worry about them. Use this time to res and buff any tanks that died and get everyone to full HP. Phase 2 is characterized by Aura of Desire, which means that any damage you deal to the boss, 50% of it will be reflected to you. So be mindful to not kill yourself during this phase. Past that, you have Deaden, cast by the boss on the current target and increases damage taken by 100% for 10 seconds on that target. Tanks must spell reflect this back to the boss. Spirit Shock must be interrupted. It deals a huge amount of damage to the tank. And Rune Shield should be spell stealed by a mage or eaten by a fell hunter. Finally, we have phase 3. This is characterized by Aura of Anger, which applies an ever-increasing amount of shadow damage every 3 seconds. So at this point, this boss is a DPS race, and you should pop Lust and all your CDs once this starts. Tanks need to deal with Soul Scream, which is a frontal cone, so always have the boss facing away from the raid. This deals a base amount of damage, and more damage the more rage or mana the tank has. So tanks must dump all their rage or mana before this ability happens. DPS must also be careful when they receive Seethe. This happens every time the boss switches targets, and it increases threat generated. And healers need to be mindful of players afflicted by spite. And that's everything there is to know about Reliquary of Souls. It's now time for the last part of the raid, which is definitely the hardest three bosses. Starting off with Mother Shiraz. For this boss, everyone in the raid except tanks want to have 178 8 shadow resistance unbuffed. That's 248 with a shadow protection buff from a priest. You can go with less or more depending on how good your healers are or how fast you can react to mechanics, but generally that's how much everyone seems to suggest. You'll want to start this fight with a hunter that misdirects to the tank, but before that every ranged player must stand under this statue's hands. You'll know when you're below it when if you have your camera pointing down and it clips below the hand. The reason you want to do this is because there's an ability that throws you in the air, so this will minimize fall damage. Do the same for the melee group on the other statue and have the tank tank the boss in the middle, away from the melees and not too close to the ranged players. You also want 3 tanks on this fight to soak the ability called Saber Lash, which is a frontal cleave with 20 yards range and deals 30k damage divided between 3 targets, so all tanks must stand in front of the boss constantly. Other than that, let's talk about what this boss does throughout the fight. First and most importantly, you have Fatal Attraction. This is the most important reason why you're using Shadow Resistance. At random intervals, there will be three players teleported to a close by location and they will have three beams connecting them. Their goal is to move away from each other as fast as possible to break these beams and stop the damage they're receiving. 
There's also going to be one of four beams happening every 9 seconds, hitting 10 random raid members. Some deal flat shadow damage, some knock you up in the air and deal shadow damage, and some apply a debuff and a mana burn. So just keep the raid topped at all times and make sure to have people teleported move away from each other as fast as possible. And you should easily deal with this boss if you have enough shadow resistance. As you're moving to the next boss, you'll encounter this weird mob, Promenade Sentinel. This guy has three abilities, L1, L4 and L5 Arcane Charge. L1 is a flat arcane damage to a random player. L4 is a beam that he throws somewhere on the ground and that deals a ton of damage, move away from it fast. And L5 is cast over 3 seconds and it's a one-shot ability on a random player that deals 100% of the target's maximum health. The way to avoid the player targeted by this dying is either by LOSing it or by having the player targeted topped on HP fast and having a power word shield cast on him or her. Anyways, moving on to the Eladari Council. This is in my opinion probably the hardest boss in this raid. I had more wipes on this with multiple different raids than any other boss. So this is a council type boss, kind of like Hiking Molgar in Gru's Lair. The only difference here is that all the bosses have their health linked, so when you deal damage to one all their health goes down. So stacking a couple when possible and AOEing them is definitely the go-to strategy. But you can only do that on a couple of them, because Lady Melande has a reflective shield sometimes, so you can't stack her with the other bosses. High Nethermancer Zerivor spams Arcane Explosion throughout the fight, so you can't stack him either. Which leaves Gatios the Shatterer and Veras Dark Shadow to be stacked. That being said, Veras is a rogue, and he will vanish and go to a random player applying deadly poison on them, every now and then. So he will only be attackable at certain times. Which leaves Gathios the Shatterer, who's gonna be your main target for most players, because he's gonna receive the most raid debuffs, and periodically you'll have Varus the Rogue coming close by so you can AoE as well. So what does Gathios do? Well, he's very annoying because he uses Consecration about every 30 seconds, which deals a big amount of damage to anyone standing in it, so the tank must move him fast once that happens. On top of that, he uses Judgment, which is an ability that that can and should absolutely be spell reflected. Hence why you really need a warrior tank on this boss. And he also sometimes bops Lady Melande and she also heals him sometimes. So let's talk about her. Lady Melande must be tanked by one of the off tanks and her heals should absolutely always be interrupted. She also casts other spells which can and should be interrupted as much as possible. But the problem is she sometimes goes immune to either physical or magical damage. Therefore you must have at least four interrupters stay on her at all times. Two physical and two magical, so the tank and three other players. Other than that, you have Zerivor. This guy must be tanked by a mage tank who wants to constantly spell steal his dampen magic. So the pool on this fight is crucial. Ideally, you want to have four different hunters MD each boss to its respective tank at the start. The mage tank wants to pull Zerivor to the left side of the room, at least 10 yards away from everybody else, to avoid having arcane explosions hitting everyone else. Gathios and Veras will be stacked on the right side of the room and they must be moved ASAP when Blizzard, Flamestrike or Consecrate is on melee camp. Ideally, you want to kite the boss in a circular path pattern around the right side of the room. But don't blindly follow this path, because there could be a blizzard or a flame strike on the way. And keep Lady Melande interrupted constantly, especially her heals. The main reason why people wipe on this fight is because of bad pulling or because too many players die over time by standing on Blizzard, Flamestrike or Consecrate. Taking one tick of these abilities is fine if it spawns on you, but you should never take a second tick. Okay, moving on to Illidan Storm Rage. Illidan is a 5 phase fight, but it's relatively easy if you can get him past phase 2. Before you start, you need one Warlock with max shadow resistance gear, and two tanks with max fire resistance gear. Phase 1 takes place from 100% to 65% of the boss, and the main tank must face the boss away from the raid so that draw soul only hits the tank. And periodically, the tank will also be targeted by flame crash, which is a ground AoE ability that the tank must move away from. 
During this phase, everyone can stack, and every 30 seconds, a random player will receive the Parasitic Shadowfin debuff. Said player must move away from the raid, and when the debuff expires, two Shadowfins will spawn. They only have 3k HP, but they must be killed fast, because if they reach another player, that player will also receive the debuff, and it's gonna get chaotic from there. Other than that, that's everything there is about phase 1. Move away from the flames, drop Shadowfins away from the raid, and kill them fast. Phase 2 starts at 65%. Illidan will become immune and starts flying. 10 seconds later, he will throw his glaives on the ground and two fire elementals will spawn from them. Save your lost end cooldowns for this phase and pop them as soon as they spawn. So, each one of the off tanks with full fire resistance must take one elemental each and tank them always away from the raid and where they spawned for now, but they will be constantly moving them throughout this phase. That's because those fire elementals often cast blaze, which is a big fire patch that spawns on top of the elemental. So the tank tanking said elemental must move him out of the AoE. But he must also make sure to not face the elemental into the raid to not have a flame breath going on the raid. And also never move away too far from the warglaives that the elemental is linked to. Because if that happens, both elementals will enrage and wipe the raid pretty much. Good tank positioning is key to winning this phase. I should also mention, for this phase, you also want to have the rest of the raid split in three groups in a triangle around the circle in the middle. That's because Illidan will periodically throw a fireball on a random player which deals AoE damage. So you want to minimize how many players are affected by this. Also, during this phase, Illidan will cast Eye Beam, which are two lines of blue fire that deal a ton of damage to anyone standing on top of them. The good news is there's only four possible paths to this Eye Beam. This, this, this and this. Did I mention tanking the elementals is hectic during this phase? Okay, once both elementals are dead, Illidan will finally land, and you'll now be on phase 3. Phase 3 is the same as phase 1, except now everyone wants to spread out, because a random player can be targeted by agonizing flames, dealing AoE damage around him. Also, every 40 to 50 seconds, Illidan will switch to phase 4, his demon form. At this point, the warlock tank must take over and stand as far away from the boss as possible, because during phase 4, Shadow Demon demons will appear, fixating 4 random players, one of which can be the warlock tank, stunning said players and running towards them. If they don't die before reaching them, those players will die. I should mention, every time a phase transition happens, Illidan's threat is wiped, so make sure to stop DPS before that happens. Finally, you have phase 5, which starts when Maiev appears. This phase is very similar to phase 3, with the addition of a soft enrage every 40 seconds that Illidan receives for 20 seconds. You can remove the enrage by moving Illidan to a trap that Maiev will put somewhere in the room, but be very careful not to face him towards the raid and wait for people to reposition away from the trap and spread out. And that's pretty much everything you need to know about Black Temple. There's a lot of information and I almost certainly forgot some stuff. So if you notice something missing or a mistake, please let us know in the comments. With that, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, remember to give it a like and subscribe to the Classic WoW Curios channel for more content like this. I will see you guys in the next one very soon. Bye for now.